Want some conversation to check the noise uh, volumes. Thank you, thank you, Councillor Issa. I hope it all seems okay online in terms yeah. of volume. Fine, yeah, it's, it's coming good. <clears throat> okay, perfect. Right, let's get started then. Um, so I'd like to welcome everyone to our um, panel meeting today. And um, this is our third meeting of the year um, of this um, um, first meeting this year, but third, meet, third, meeting, third time we're meeting as a panel. Um, I'd like to welcome any members of the public joining us online, um, uh, members that we have as well. So thank you, panel members. Um, and we also, we've also got two guests with us today. So we've got Lord Isda Barry, um, who's the Director of Housing. And we've got Amanda Lowe's um, Assistant Director of Homelessness, Independence and Preventative Services. So great to have you back joining us again for our meeting. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to move on to agenda item two. Apologies for absence. Are there any apologies for absence that anyone has? I think we've just got um, Councillor Adriana George for lateness. That's correct, Chair. Yeah. Yep, okay, thank you. Um, so that, that's noted. Um, so I move on to agenda item three, which is the notes of the meeting held on the 13th of December 2021. So the, as this isn't, is not a formal meeting, the notes of the last minute, minute last meeting will be noted. Um, on that matter, does anyone have any comments or anything to add before we move on? No, OK, so we'll, we'll note that. Um, OK, so we've gone to agenda item four and we have a presentation today um, uh, about housing staff um, and the engagement survey that was carried out. So in this meeting um, of the deep dive process, we're looking, uh, our focus is on engagement um, and we're looking at engagement with residents, organisations and other interested groups. Um, and today we have colleagues from the housing department who are back with us uh, to share their findings of a recent engagement that they carried out with housing staff. Um, we expect that these findings will inform the deep dives term of residents, uh, term of reference to the question that we had. So I just um, remind you of the question that one of the terms of reference that we decided on, um, which was to find out how satisfied customer service staff are with their roles and how empowered they feel within the gov within the department um, and how that can affect um, attitudes of staff towards residents or um, service users. Um, so uh, as mentioned earlier, we've got Lord de Barry with us and Amanda Lowe's, and I'd like to invite them at this point to share their analysis of the findings. Um, also, just to say, I know, Lord, is that you need to leave by 8 p.m. So I'm, I'm sure we've got more than enough time to um, to answer any questions as well when we get to that. So, yeah, over to Lord is and Amanda. OK, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm going to hand over to Amanda. But like I said, like um, you said, um, from the last meeting, we agreed to come back and give you a little bit of feedback in relation to the survey that's carried out uh, within the HIP service. So Amanda will present the results of the survey that was carried out. Amanda, take it away. <clears throat> OK, and. OK, can everyone see the screen? Yep. Yep, OK. Um, so this does just start with a bit of context because it also is in sort of engagement with a variety of people that are contacting the service. So um, it's looking at the contact points that come into the service, um, the fact that there are increasing demands, um, which everybody is sort of quite well aware of. Um, we did a staff survey, it was in December, so it is very recent. It was just last month um, and it was covering items such as the well-being, you know, whether people had the right tools and resources to do the job, the performance and the training and all ultimately the customer service. Um, and then finally, what we're doing in relation to our own sort of service improvements, and I suppose how the findings of this can also feed into that. 
So, um, so just a reminder, really, of how customers contact us. So they contact us by telephone. Um, there is a direct dial number into My Independence. My Independence is the sort of public-facing name um, of our service. So that is a number that people don't have to go through any options. It is just direct dial. Or people can come through the switchboard and go through some options that come through to the service. Um, people contact us by emails. Um, the two largest are around the My Independence. Um, that also links through from our website, but also duty to refer. So other agencies and partner agencies have a statutory duty to refer into our service um, where the, they identify a sort of risk of homelessness. We also have another of other sort of inboxes. So we have um, an, an NHS inbox where GPs can refer through to. We have inquiries from landlords. We have statutory reviews, rough sleeping and sort of general business support inquiries. People also contact us online through the online housing application um, and also through the change of circ circumstances application. So those come straight through to us online. Um, in person, um, although we're not specifically running services from Hounslow House, people do still drop into Hounslow House. Um, they use the phones um, and also we go out to see people. Um, we carry out outreach work, so we're doing street-based outreach work, um, specifically around rough sleeping. Um, but there's also domestic violence outreach and there's sessions that are held on a multi-agency basis. And then we have referrals coming in through other services. Um, so some of those come through inboxes, come through different systems. We'll come on to that. Um, and generally internal, we're looking at social services, community solutions, community safety, private sector housing, where they identify um, you know, sort of property conditions, but also external through health, you know, through hospitals, GP, social prescribers, through prison, probation, job centre, um, through Streetlink in relation to rough sleepers and through agencies such as um, Citizens Advice Bureau. So, so this is a summary just of the sort of increasing demands that the service is facing. Um, and <clears throat> in relation to the top line shows telephone calls um, that were answered and it shows sort of pre-March 2020, so pre-pandemic, and then the, the averages over the last 12 months. So from 500 to 2000 um, on average per month. And then in person, um, so pre-pandemic, we were seeing about 500 people per person. And even though a lot of our um, customer contact has gone online, it's, it's now sort of going back up to those pre-pandemic levels. So we're seeing a rising number of people actually um, wanting to interact in person and if we then combine those figures together um, is that pre-pandemic we were looking at about a thousand people contacting us per month um, whereas the averages over September to November last year um, is is more than double that so nearly two and a half thousand so if we then look at one of the requests um, actually from, from Scrutiny Power was around the number of emails that are received in the service. So the emails that come into the My Dependence um, inbox between January and December last year was just over 14,000. Um, and then we put down some averages per month. In relation to duty to refer, we're not actually collating that information at the time in the same way as we are with My Dependence, but on average, it's about 1,000 um, for that period. So around 80 odd a month. Um, we get referrals coming directly through adult social care through a, a, an IT system that we both use. Um, so that's around 60 a month. And then we get housing register applications coming into us online. So around 250 on average per month. It does fluctuate. Um, so when we then look at the the sort of the electronic um, correspondence that's coming in, um, we're looking at around sort of 1,500 um, pieces of correspondence coming in. Um, and then on the, if we add that to the telephones and the, in, <coughs> excuse me, in person, um, that totals up to nearly 4,000. It doesn't include everything. So, um, so the lists above don't include everything that's coming in through NHS emails or street-based outreach, for, for example. So, so in, in December, we basically um, did a survey of our staff to cover a whole range of um, items. So some of that was about, you know, how are you? Any concerns about going to Hounslow House? We're coming to some of the questions. And some of it was very practical. Um, do people have the tools to do the job? Do they have access to the right systems? Do they need additional training? And what does that look like? And, you know, what can we do to actually, you know, improve? 
So about 55, so 55 staff responded, uh, which is 77 percent. So it is uh, it is very high response. Uh, we carried it out through the Microsoft Teams function of doing a survey. So it's very easy for staff and straightforward. And we carried it out in December. Um, and there's just a note there that it did coincide with the emergence of the Omicron variant of COVID. So that's relevant because it comes through um, just in a couple of the answers. Um, the presentation of, so, of some of the answers, it summarises the questions that illustrate key themes. Um, it doesn't go through every single question that really wouldn't be relevant for this purpose today. Um, and I've mentioned there, it includes some practical information. So we were asking things like, you know, making sure we've got a track of computer asset numbers, if people have got lockers, have they got all their information up to date on the system, emergency contact numbers. So it's really doing some, some housekeeping as well with the staff. Um, in the preamble to the survey, when we sent it out, um, then staff were advised that the responses would only be seen by specific managers. So, so for the purposes of today, obviously we can't identify anything specific that staff said because they weren't aware at the time that it, it would obviously feature here. Um, and any specific issues that were raised by staff were being addressed by managers. Um, but obviously we can provide an anonymised summary. So, <laughs> in terms of um, some of the categories, so the ones that were framed around the well-being, we were asking people if you'd actually worked from Hounslow House. Now, um, 33 answered yes, 22 answered no. So, so quite a high proportion of staff that we've got within the service um, had actually joined the council during the lockdown restrictions um, from March 2020 onwards. So they've never actually had that experience of working from Hounslow House and they've all been working basically from home, um, although some of those people working in an outreach capacity. So we went on to ask if people did have concerns about working from home um, and three people did raise concerns and the themes around that were actually they, people were missing some of that interaction that they would otherwise have had in, in the office. And interesting, those responses did come from people who had previously worked in the office rather than those that actually hadn't. Um, and and also some people express concerns about it's easier to work longer hours from home without having travelling time. Um, people aren't necessarily switching off so quickly. So that's something that obviously we keep a, a close eye on just in terms of the staff wellbeing. And then we also asked whether people have sufficient private space at home, um, which is really important when dealing with things like confidential phone calls, et cetera. Um, and, you know, I think it's it's useful to remind that throughout the whole pandemic, Hounslow House has been open and available for staff to work in if they haven't actually had the right setup at home. Um, but we did identify that the one respondent who, who actually said it wasn't ideal, so it was a yes or no answer. We didn't have any variables on that. Um, they do actually spend quite you know, most of their time actually outward facing. So they're actually dealing with people um, in their properties. Um, so we then actually asked about whether people have concerns about working from Hounslow House. Um, and again, this is the context of this was done in December and it was done um, as the Omicron variant was actually um, rising. So the concerns that people were saying were basically in relation to having concerns about what was happening with Omicron at the, at the time. So that heavily, heavily featured. Um, but the other theme that came through was actually people saying that they thought they really worked more efficiently from home um, and they didn't have the, the sort of the travel times and they didn't have maybe some of the distractions um, through the office. So they were the two, two key themes there that were coming through. Um, then still on staff wellbeing, um, we also wanted to find out whether staff were really sort of paying attention to the information that is provided corporately, the support that is provided corporately, um, and whether people are actually looking at, at the intranet and all of the updates that come out and all of the support that is available. So um, so 34 were saying yes and, and some 21 were saying no, um, but those that were saying no were identified as those were actually saying they didn't really feel they needed additional help or support, um, but they did actually know where to look. So there were some other sort of questions that sat beneath this about whether making sure that people knew where to look for information. Um, so then we asked quite an open question about do people feel they need other help and support um, around their general well-being. Um, so eight people answered yes. Um, and actually, rather than well-being support, it actually came through as quite practical support. So it was it was about having a bit more clarity around some some written processes and some things that might need updating or, or might change, um, but also about having those casework discussions. And it's one thing we'd identified that the difference between working in an office 
office environment where people will, if you like, huddle together to have a casework discussion and actually having to make more of an effort to, to have that online in group discussions. So that's certainly something that we've, you know, we've taken on board. We then looked at whether people had the necessary resources and tools to do the job. Um, so did people need additional equipment? Um, some people answered yes. So the majority said no, they were fine. Um, but those that answered yes, some, some of it were actually their equipment was, was failing. So things like headsets, um, some people needing like an additional screen, a larger screen, um, and some people identifying that actually a work mobile would be useful. So um, one person was working particularly with young people and had difficulties getting hold of them and needed to be tested. Texting. So, so some practical things that we've then sort of picked up and, and dealt with. Um, we asked around the health and safety, around pe whether people have a personal safety device. Now, um, some staff have been working out in the community throughout the pandemic, particularly those that let properties and have got personal safety devices. For those staff that have joined the service, where there's an expectation that they would carry out home visits in the future, they haven't been issued with personal safety devices yet because they haven't needed them. Um, so basically, there's a number of staff that don't have them, but um, we do have we do have the supplies of those. So we were just sort of checking in with people. Um, we also asked whether people have access to our sort of main shared drive where we keep a whole directory of information um, and this identified that some people didn't um, and this is where there's been some changes of staff either staff transferring into the team um, but also we're in a transition where we're sort of up, upgrading information so we can get it better onto one drive rather than just onto a shared drive um, but it was useful information just to identify that that some people actually didn't have the access there. Um, and also we then asked people whether they thought there were other systems that might help them to do their job that they didn't have access to. Um, and um, so are there any systems you require access to that you don't, don't have? Um, actually, I apologise, that's the wrong way around. And um, the people that said yes was actually, um, sorry, no, I'm getting it wrong. There was a high percentage of people said yes, they would benefit from having used to use of other systems. Now, within our service, we use a whole range of systems. So we have access to benefit systems. We have access to rough sleeping systems. Um, we have access to things like credit checks, etc. So um, as our team has has grown, has expanded, then not everyone has access to everything because there's different license permissions. Um, but this identified that people did actually um, recognise that they would benefit from having access to wider systems across the service so that is something that we're um, that we're addressing going forwards so we also then asked staff about training and development so whether people thought that they needed additional training to help them to do their job um, and 42 of the respondents said yes and those that were answering yes covered a really broad range. So it wasn't everybody said one thing. Um, it was basically people really wanting to expand, really wanting to improve their skills and their knowledge. Um, people that might be used to doing a job in, in one area of the service, but actually want to expand and enhance their knowledge and skills in another area. So we'll come on to the training um, shortly in this presentation. And then also we are specifically about whether whether people have a sort of wider understanding of floating support. So we're dealing with a lot of vulnerable people that may need additional support. Um, and some people said they weren't they didn't have a good understanding of the floating support provision that's available. So we're arranging briefing sessions um, for those staff. We asked staff whether they specifically attended security of tenure training. Um, and this is designed to help staff identify whether people have rights to remain in their accommodation and whether there's a threat of homelessness. So we identified that the newest staff um, that joined us at the end of last year hadn't yet attended, but they will be. And this is really important when, when we're trying to alleviate sometimes people's worries. People worry that they're going to get evicted, but actually they might not be getting evicted if they, you know, they need to understand what their rights are. So that's a really important training piece for us. Um, and also whether people are familiar with resources on the council website. So yeah. um, so our own pages that, that we put on the website and the links to other resources. And there was only one person in the service that, that said no. And obviously we, could, we can identify that and, and deal with that. So, so we then focused in on customer service um, and looking at confidence levels of staff so how confident were staff dealing with the whole range of inquiries that come through on the telephone um, so broadly um, the majority of staff and this was a this was a lower cohort than the whole survey because we asked people first um, do you cover telephone duty do you cover the sort of generic telephone duty um, but 
but 23 out of the 27 um, basically said yes they're broadly confident and then um, that four people who basically said no um, were the newest staff who are undergoing training at the moment so there's a broad range of confidence however what we also then did was drill down into some of the areas that come through on the telephone um, and this is combined across homelessness and housing register um, so we want to know how confident people were and there was a scale on that um, and the response here just pick up the sort of like people that are broadly confident um, against those that aren't so we had we had eight respondents and actually they weren't confident particularly um, so recognizing that not everybody in the service is confident responding to calls um, not everybody in the service does deal with those calls specifically and they will pass them on to other people but we actually want anybody that answers the phone and anybody in the service to be to be more confident about dealing with the calls um, and again we'll, we'll come on to that so then um, we ask people, and th this is something that we regularly update, but we ask people about other languages that they speak, um, because that is really, really crucial within the service where people come through and English may not be their first language. So um, currently 32 people that responded out of the 55 are fluent in other languages, and between them there's 25 different languages. So uh, we then keep that record, and then when people come through on the phone and they speak a different language, um, then we will see if we've got that immediately in the team um, to be able to actually assist. And then we also asked, um, specifically, we asked about a range of training, but um, the general data protection regulations um, is whether everybody had completed. And it was um, a relief for us to see that 100% of staff had completed. That is what we expected. Um, but at least everybody really recognised the importance of GDPR training um, about how we handle customer information, how we record customer information. So, um, so that was really actually quite positive. So then building from that, we're looking going forwards, so I'll go into slightly more detail in a moment, but in terms of staff training that we need to deliver on, so we're looking at the legislative angle of, of training, policies, procedures, the skills that staff have, the resilience and the customer care. If we combine all the, all the top five bullet points together, then actually get better customer care if people are more confident about um, the sort of the knowledge and the, and the skills that they have. Also looking at the development of staff, so their own personal development, um, linking in with the values and behaviours, linking in with, with clear review about having short and longer term goals. So not just working to sort of one goal, but having short term goals and linking that into to how we manage performance. Um, the new IT system for housing. So it's due to go live in October. Um, we're currently in the solution design phase on that. So we're very much looking actually about how that's going to improve things. We'll then be into testing and we'll then be into actually how do we streamline, how do we better streamline our processes, which can benefit our staff, but also obviously our customers. Um, and then in terms of customer engagement, so there's various discussions going on at corporate level about the platforms that can be used to engage with customers. Um, we're also looking at how we can get improved information from the new telephone system and improved interaction through the IT system. So just to expand slightly on those, um, so in terms of the next steps during this year, so, so with staff training, we're looking at a whole range of knowledge. So improving the knowledge base of staff. So people don't just pick up the phone and answer a question about, for example, the housing register or homelessness. They've got the whole range. So they know about support services. <clears throat> They've got much more knowledge at their fingertips. A lot of that knowledge is shared across the team, um, but we want to get that a bit more structured um, so it's easier for staff to access. And in terms of IT systems, so it's ensuring that staff can have access to multiple IT systems um, and that they also know how to use them and they and they appreciate, you know, what they can use them for and how they can help them do their job. So an example of that is that people have access to iWorld, which is the housing benefit system, but also um, covers council tax. So there's a number of staff in the team that have access to that already, not everybody. But people realise that when we're trying to verify information from customers, rather than constantly asking the customer to prove things to us we can use our own systems so it's trying to get smarter about how we actually use those 
and also about upskilling staff generally in terms of coaching and mentoring staff um, so that they can handle customer contact and manage expectations more effectively. So sometimes, you know, staff um, inevitably will, will struggle when, you know, we can't give positive news to people. We're having to manage bad news. Um, and actually, how do we do that? How do we do that better? There is a skill in that and we, and we do need to sort of coach and mentor staff to do that. So that then links to how we develop staff. So improving the confidence of staff so they can deal with a, a much broader range of inquiries, um, which also then increases the capacity so that not all inquiries about one thing have to go to a sort of subset within the team, is that more people can actually answer those initial questions. And also developing expertise and opportunities for staff to take a lead role in certain areas. So, you know, we, we have had that developed over time, for instance, around domestic abuse. Um, it's always good to have people that are either champions or are lead areas on, on certain things that are more specific and making sure that we regularly review staff training needs and their aspirations um, because what people are interested in can also be what they actually are very good at. So it's trying to really link in all of those things together. And then the combination of having sort of like a new phone system um, imminently, the IT system later on this year, and also looking at customer engagement differently. What we will actually gain from that is we will gain improved reporting from the telephone data. Um, and it's qualitative as well as quantitative. So the qualitative stuff, it will be able to recognize certain things like keywords, we'll be able to recognize repeat callers. So we'll be able to actually address and, and tackle things from a system point point of view. Um, we'll also have a greater overview and call volumes coming in so we can direct resources. So we know manually what our busiest days are, um, but not everybody, not all the staff have oversight of that. So, you know, we might have a number of people on duty who are really, really busy some days and then it's quiet on other days. And the system will give us much more transparency over that so that people aren't wasting their time um, sitting on a phone duty when it's quiet. But equally, we can make sure we have enough people when it's really, really busy. Um, in terms of the new ICT system, um, we will have reduced administrative time spent on that system. We often have to double handle data at the moment. There's better integration. So that means that the time that we can save on that, we can actually spend more time um, on the contact with customers. You know, whether that's by email, whether that's by phone, um, it will actually free up some of that time. We'll also have better reporting around performance um, and we'll also have broader data sets which can identify trends and then flex resources. So we'll have much better data insight um, and, and capturing the data coming through about the types of inquiries. Um, we're then actually reviewing how to best collect feedback from customers. So, so some of the functionality on the new phone system, you can get people to, um, you know, you can you can rank calls. We can look at how we can do surveys. We can look at whether, you know, we can do text messaging, emails after calls and things. So, so it's very much looking at how can we engage with customers in different ways that suits them, um, because not everybody will access online services. Um, how do we do that? How do we collate that? And how do we use that information once we've got it so and that was the end of the presentation so it's over to any questions great thank you so much for the presentation um, and for sharing your findings from the staff survey with us i think there's lots of really interesting and useful information and data as well um, so so thank you um, as a linguist myself, I was really interested to hear that there are 25 languages, I think you said, that are spoken yep. and offered to our um, to service users and our residents. So that's that's really good and pleasing to hear. I'm sure it's more comfortable um, uh, kind of raising things in a language you're more familiar with. So, yeah, so that was really, really good to see. Um, so I do see we do have councillors with their hands up. Um, sorry, I don't know if this is the right order that they went up in, but I'm just going to say them as I see them. Um, I will go to my vice chair first. So, Councillor Eason, um, if you'd like to start off with any questions you may have, please. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, two questions. Um, in terms of training records, um, uh, uh, do we uh, what, what records do we uh, take uh, keep as an employer? to know and to be able to evidence that um, our staff have completed mandatory training. 
So, for example, the GDPR, it's great that the staff recognise that they um, have all completed uh, completed it, but I would have expected that we would have a record ourselves and that some parts of the service might be subject to um, regulatory inspection or, or, or similar. Um, and then the second uh, question was really about uh, building a bit more about the um, um, staff uh, welfare about um, uh, I think our concern was um, when we were doing the terms of reference um, was that staff may get um, um, overwhelmed by um, continually uh, providing uh, having to provide um, residents with bad news or uh, or not being able to solve their problem um, so uh, um, I, I'm wondering whether you whether your survey um, um, touched into that area. And so it's, uh, I suppose our concern is about um, mental health well-being, um, about resilience um, and um, uh, around those those sort of difficult conversations. Thank you. OK, so, um, so in relation to some of the mandatory trainers, there's two ways in which um, Re training records are recorded so some training is actually through um through iHoundslow um people can book and train um people can book courses through that so we can actually get reports off of that in relation to the GDPR training um then that is information that is also verified corporately um so there was a big push on making sure that everybody had 100% training and we got records um through um information governance I believe we're actually controlling that at the time um but that was held centrally in relation to some of the um other training that we might record then um, we haven't got a formal mechanism for that so for instance if we're doing security of tenure training um, that doesn't go through like the council system as such then we're, we're recording that if you like manually on a on a central um, database direct spreadsheet so we're keeping we're keeping records not just relying on staff telling us we will verify that they've actually attended those we're not we're not taking their word for it, I suppose is the answer to that <laughs> Um, and I, th I think in terms of in terms of the resilience and the welfare of staff, um, I mean, I share your concerns. I think it's fair to say um, because we're fully aware of, you know, the difficulties that staff are facing on the phones. We very much look at um, what duties are on, making sure that people aren't, aren't having to cover things, you know, all day, every day dealing with the same things. So we try and mix it up. We have we have a lot of. Um, staff that cover our phone duties for instance um, so it's not just a small team doing phone duty day in day out um, it's a lot of different staff and therefore they're dealing with different inquiries so when we look at the range of inquiries that come through it's not all bad news um, and then staff are also doing a combination of casework where they are getting positive outcomes so it's trying to have that balance but it's also you know where, where staff might be struggling it's making sure uh, we identify that they talk to us um, and I think you know so, some of the things that came through the survey where people were saying about having you know like casework discussions casework supervision um, and actually how we can how we can better facilitate that online is a way of staff being able to offload some of those difficulties so um, so those things do take place but I think we've recognized that we need to um, I wouldn't say formalize them but just make sure that all staff are involved um, because you know for, for staff to maintain their sort of resilience of dealing with stuff they they need to discuss these things you know they can't just keep it all to themselves but it's something that um you know looking at looking at training looking at things like reflective practice um there's a whole you know there's a whole sort of training suite going forwards um for staff it's but it, you know it's been different having to deal with things on the phone than it was face to face mm. great thank you um councillor ethan did you have any follow-up questions to that um, no, I think just uh, thank you there. The things like refractive practice, um, the, these sort of things, um, um, and casework supervision. Um, I, yeah, I think the yeah the parallels there with mental health um, services and counselling services. I think it sounds like you've definitely recognised, um, and I yeah I think we all will all recognise some of the difficulties just from the kind of casework that we deal with from time to time. Um, yeah, so um, 
yeah thank you great thank you um i'd like to now move on to councillor Umer. do you have any questions for our our guest today yeah thank you chair um so just going back on the uh, on that presentation i think on the first or the um initial few slides there seems to be a uh, i think there was a large uh, obviously shift in <clears throat> i think it was from 500 or so to like two two thousand mm -hmm. plus kind of a calls etc um i think the obvious the obvious thing that comes to mind is uh in terms of the quality of service whether what impact it had on that and how that was dealt with and when talking about quality of service what are, i mean um that 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 change or the increase in calls whether all customers were attended to and if not uh what other mechanisms are or were there in place um uh, whether you got back to them and were there any kind of percentages um uh, in terms of calls responded to or case works that came across mm -hmm. were dealt with So, so I think there's there's been information provided through um, customer services in relation to the percentage answer rates of calls. Um, I don't know whether that's been circulated, but there's been a lot of data analysis on that and and the averages. Um, I think in ter in terms of those volumes, um, we've very much had to adjust our team um, and adjust things like the duties that people cover, so that we can at least you know respond to as many calls as as we possibly can. Basically, inevitably, I think what we've noticed is is that when people are waiting in a queue. Um, they have to they in the current system they wait for five minutes before it goes to voicemail and the newer system it'll be different so that will be better for us um, but people actually um, don't wait that long so the dropped calls tend to generally be less than five minutes um, and I think in terms in terms of the quality of service um, the overall quality of how how we assess um, one thing I think we were clear on is that we you know we are not in a position to if you like drop our standards we, we cannot start working differently um, just because we've got higher volumes we still have to actually maintain you know the right standards in relation to the policy and the legislation that we're working to um, what it has resulted in is slower response times now what we are picking up and what we've had to pick up over the last two years is the most urgent cases so we had to immediately respond to people that were homeless that were threatened with homelessness that were actually homeless um, and it did mean that people that were for instance applying to the housing register where there wasn't a threat of homelessness had to wait long Longer for their application to be dealt with um, but actually we're also very clear that waiting times on the housing register are you know are a long time so people actually aren't missing out so we basically had to make adjustments based on what we could see coming through um, and yeah, and we'll continue to do so yeah um just then uh, just a follow-up chair so uh, on that i think so what i gathered from there was that you obviously prioritized the uh, more kind of urgent um, cases and anything other that what is that is that also or will be at some point looked into or is that just a backlog that will just carry on until services or I suppose the numbers are back to usual pre-pandemic at this point yeah I think um, I think the numbers won't go back to pre-pandemic for quite some time um, it's a matter of actually how how we resource like within our team, how we work more efficiently so that we can actually get through things quicker. And I think, you know, one, one of the things that I'd give an example of is around actually using the IT systems that are at the council's disposal so that we can actually get information more efficiently rather than relying on the customer giving it to us. So there's things that we're doing that actually enable us to verify things from our own resources, which actually speed things up. So we're constantly looking at actually we are facing increased demands. How do we get through the work quicker um, when you know when we're not going to sort of sit and wait until um, numbers drop um, we're going to work on the basis that we're still going to deal with high volumes and we need to be more efficient with how we do it all right thanks great thank you councillor Umair and thank you amanda um i'd like to now move on to um councillor george i can see that you're next and um, with any questions that you may have thank you 
Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Amanda, and all the uh, panel. Um, excellent content, and it's great for us to know all the information. Um, I believe two of my questions that I had was on quality and mandatory training, and I'm quite content and happy with how we manage expectation effectively. However, I'm going to take an opportunity to ask two specific questions, which might not be about the staff training. I'm quite aware our staff um, that they wearing that they go out they're wearing cameras and things like that right oh, the stuff that goes on so don't make um, on homeless what about the homeless when we report homeless today what kind of safety we provide to the homeless team when they go and and interact with people ha are on the street and a second question i had from one of the residents he was i know it's not specifically to to staff how do um how do we get involved and what do we have in place for the young offenders that they come out of the prison, specifically into housing? That's all from me. Thank you. OK, so in, in relation to street homeless, so um, so we go out and interact with people in a street based environment. Um, the staff don't wear cameras. Um, they do have personal safety devices. Um, they always go out in at least pairs. Um, there are robust, if you like, you know, safety risk assessments around that. And if there are any concerns around behaviour, um, they have vehicles that are close by. So they'll go out with a the vehicle. They use the council zip cars, etc. Um, so they're they're very well, if you like, trained in their own personal safety and risk assessment. Um, and it's very much about doing a dynamic risk assessment on the spot. You know, if they also, um, if they're interacting with somebody on the street, um, they cannot interact with groups of individuals so they can interact with one or two but they cannot be outnumbered um, so um, there is another team that works pan london so if for instance there was a hotspot of rough sleepers that 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 just showed up and there was about five or six of people um, then there would actually be a pan london response to that alongside our outreach team and if necessary alongside police colleagues um, so it's making sure that they do not go into um, a dangerous situation um, that would put them at risk yeah so we have we have various mechanisms in around that um in relation to young offenders um can i just ask when you say young what age are you talking um i mean over 18 over 18 yeah so so basically um it's about us having those links with prison and probation um so we are just on the cusp of having co-location with probation um we actually have a lead officer we have a new officer that we've recruited that's starting next week um and it's about actually getting that information before people come out of custody so um there are a lot of people at the moment that are going in and out of custody they might be on remand um they might then come out from remand but there's also people coming out of prison that are sentenced so there's a whole range of different circumstances not just for young people but for everybody um, and while some issues may have been slightly suppressed during the pandemic they're certainly um, very prevalent now in terms of people being arrested people being remanded like I say people being released so um, so generally when people are coming out of prison um, we will work with probation we will look at risk assessments we will provide emergency accommodation um, and we will assess the needs for longer term accommodation because um, it links to actually the first question about street homelessness if somebody's coming out of prison and they don't have anywhere to go they are likely to end up sleeping on the streets we don't want that to happen so we will try to intercept and prevent that from happening thank you very much i appreciate that great thank you councillor george for your questions and thank you thank you amanda um i'd like to now move on to councillor biddulph um when any questions you may have thank you Thanks very much. Um, and thank you, not just for the presentation, but for taking on board a point I raised last time, which was to explain what HIPS is. So thank you very much for that. That was at the top of a, a chart. Um, I don't think that you asked this question, but I may be wrong. Did you ask any questions just around workload? Do you have too much? Are you managing with it? What do you do when you have too much? Have there been any slips through the system? I don't know if you included that in your survey and my reason for asking that is that I do know that with one quite difficult case in my ward turning green an important email which shifted things was missed because so many are flowing in and that ties in I think with your point about phone data obviously you can collect that because it's coming through a machine 
Um, I don't know how you monitor, if it's possible to monitor, whether people are getting too many emails, if some of them are flooding in when they're unhelpful, you know, all those questions I'm concerned about. Um, in terms of having the confidence in managing bad news, that's really important. It would tie in with a couple of cases that I'm, I've, got, I've got on my desk. But there's also no news. And that's even harder to manage. From a staff point of view, it might be that you're not concerned about it because there's nothing to report. Meanwhile, the resident is terribly anxious because they haven't heard anything. Um, the fourth one was about urgency and whether there are other categories than homelessness and how that works and who holds the trump card, if you like, if there are two competing for similar things. Um, and then I'd like to know what the personal safety device is and how often it's been used. And then at some point, I'd love to know the 25 languages. <laughs> We've got them all listed. Um, <laughs> I'm sure you have. I haven't yeah. seen them myself yet. Yeah, they're quite, quite wide ranging, actually. <laughs> we can provide those. <laughs> we can, we can yeah, it'd be nice to see. If I, would, I would love to know as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. To a staff, there's no problem with that because it's um, it's anonymised anyway. But obviously, we utilise yeah. that. So I think um, so. Perhaps I'll work backwards through your questions. So languages will provide the personal safety devices. Um, so we've got um, the the council's chosen safety device is a SkyGuard device. So it's quite sophisticated. Um, it links to the individual. Um, there's I'm sure somebody would be happy to to tell you all about how they work. Um, but yeah, that that's what we use. Um, so it's a SkyGuard device that links through to people's mobile phones, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so they can give us quite a lot of information. Um, they give things like description of individuals. So if there is an emergency call, there's a description. If they've got vehicle, it can link to, um, you know, vehicle details as well so that there can be responses. Um, so I could say something like help, I need help. Or is it, is it playing a different role from that? No, you can have um, so with the personal safety devices. So obviously, people can people can press the the device, um, have a code word, um, which obviously we won't mention publicly, um, so that so that you know it can go through to a central control um, and then actually raise an alert. And then it's about knowing obviously where where that person is. Yeah. So they, these these are used across the council um, in in other services. Yeah. Um, in terms of in terms of the urgency, so you're absolutely correct. Um, it's not just homelessness that is urgent because, um, by definition, we are a preventative service as well. So we want to actually get things early to prevent. We have to balance the two things off, um, which we, you know we we do do. So I think it's it's a matter of um, to give a, to give a crude example. You know, if we get a number of callers coming through on the day um, that all need responding to and need a case worker we will say do you need dealing with on the day i.e homeless on the day or do you need an appointment um, and therefore we will book somebody an appointment usually within a week sometimes it will go to two weeks or we'll, we'll see them on the day so that's really how we're assessing the urgency but in terms of other areas that aren't about people being evicted they might be about people actually that are going to have an upcoming need they might be people that are actually really worried they might be people that need support there's a lot of other different factions in the service that we identify that so so where we get referrals for support we also assess those as to whether do they need dinner dealing with right right now or do they need dealing with say within the next five days or something if we're going to refer them to to floating support for instance um so we're very much looking at people's individual needs um and you know there are there are a lot of things um that actually factor into that um, and in particular, where there's what, what we would call maybe special needs, where there's disability needs, where there's families that actually, um, you know, their accommodation isn't isn't currently suitable and finding something suitable, you know, might be quite difficult. So, um, so there's a lot of different things that might make a case really, really important, even if it doesn't need to be dealt with today, it might still be really, really important. So for us, it's about, you're absolutely correct, you know, how do we identify that? How do we identify that in all of the sort of the emails and things that come through? Um, so the staff that we have and this sort of we miss out the no news. I'll come back to that. But actually, in terms of flagging important emails, 
um, and important work that comes through. So people do log like their telephone calls. We do have to do that manually at the moment. Um, um, we can then actually monitor and pick up the themes of those. Yeah, so we can actually see and we can cross reference. So we can see if someone's called on one day and then calls on, called on another day. Um, if, you know, if something gets gets raised, we do have facility to listen into calls, for instance. Um, so, so there are, you know, there are mechanisms that we can use, but it is very manual um, in terms of how we have to sort of collate and deal with that information. So there is a certain reliance on making sure that staff will flag what is what is urgent, what is important actually coming through. But we do have the backups um, where stuff is logged um, if we need that. And we are then scanning that as well, as in, you know, we're sort of scanning that as it as it comes through when we collate everything together. And then in terms of no news, that's that's probably one of the most difficult challenges um, that actually where where we need to be interacting with somebody to actually either get things moving to progress, we're interacting with them. And where we don't have anything to say, then the customers feel we've just gone silent. But it's because there is, as you say, there's no news. And I think, you know, one of, one of the things that we want to get sort of out of customer feedback is, you know, what is the expectation of customers? So, so if a customer is on the housing register and they've been told, it's going to take them say three years or four years before they're housed and they're in year one what is their expectation of contact with us you know is it that they want to be contacted regularly um, they can't see how their application is what they would consider progressing but we can give them details of waiting times which are on the website and are updated but actually do we direct them to that enough is there more we can do to actually um, for people to help themselves where there is information out there which can give us more time this is about trying to look at that efficiency side so that it can actually give us more time to deal with the customers that that we need to engage with on a more regular basis and then in terms of workload, um, we didn't specifically ask the staff about their workloads because we have oversight of that. Um, in terms of does staff feel they've got they've got sort of you know two high caseloads, then for us um, and as a management team, it's trying to balance that out across across the offices. Um, but it actually is something that um, will be for us much easier in terms of having the oversight once we've got a new IT system later on in the year. So it's going to be easier <coughs> for us to, um, as managers, not only to be able to see the spread across the service, but also for the staff to actually more visibly see their own caseloads rather than um, relying on some of the manual systems that we have to work with at the moment. Um, but we very much look at what duties people are on, how many cases they're picking up. Um, and then it's a question of how they're then progressing those cases. So, so no, there wasn't a specific question in the in the survey um, about workloads. Okay, thank you. Can I just come up with a supplementary? Um, if it's a quick one, because I've just noticed it is almost eight, and I'm okay. just just to allow everyone. Sure, sure. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. We can raise it separately. Is that okay? Yeah. Or is it, is it quickly? Because no, no, no. You carry on, because Richard needs it there. Yeah, yeah. It's okay. Yeah. So. Um, Councillor Foote, did you have um, any further questions? Yeah, thank you, Komal. Yeah, my questions are more around the situation with, with staffing. Um, I note that um, we talk about what appears to be a, a total of 55 staff. Is that the full complement or are we short of staff is my first question. The second question is, do we in any way measure staff satisfaction? With the job, is there any any of that happening? Um, and, uh, and and you know, there's staff satisfaction with the system. And do we have a staff turnover ratio? Uh, you know, as I say, I note that we've got a total of 55 staff, but I don't know how that meets with the number of staff on the on the on numbers that we're allowed to have, and what the ratio is of turnover, which I think is very important in trying to measure a department and how you measure it, its workload and its training. OK, so in, ter in terms of the numbers, um, 55 staff um, responded to the survey, which was 77%. Um, so that that's the, the permanent staff. We do have some temporary cover as well. So um, so the, the total number of staff we've got in the service, um, say around 75. 
Um, we are recruiting at the moment. We have start dates for some people coming in. We made some adjustments. So during, after the first year really of the pandemic, we did make some adjustments to our service. Um, we looked at the management levels. We looked at the support that's needed for staff. We looked at, um, we also secured additional funding. So we're actually just recruiting to those at the moment. So, so the whole staff complement um, would be um, around 100 staff once it's fully filled. Um, so in terms of, you know, is is that enough staff? Um, is that enough staff to meet customer expectations? Probably never. Um, is that enough staff to us for us to effectively and efficiently perform our functions? Then yes, it should be. Um, but obviously, it really does rely on us having the right tools, you know, building in the new IT system um, and actually really trying to get as much efficiencies out of the staff that we've got, basically. I think your question in relation to turnover, um, the, if you were measuring us on turnover and high turnover being a negative and you looked at the last two or three years, then it would be a negative. But actually, it's a positive um, because, you know, the when when um, the Homelessness Independence Preventative Services was created, it was in response to new legislation. Um, it was a growth um, structure in response to that. There was additional funding that had come in. Um, and actually, there's been a lot of new staff that have come in that actually are quite resilient to be able to do the job. So um, so compared to some services, um, there is quite a fresh approach within our team, but it does then get reflected in quite a what seems to be a high turnover um but actually the it's not a massively high turnover in that sense because people are leaving um because they can't they can't deal with the job we're very much trying to retain the staff that we've got um and i think the the question in relation to staff satisfaction now um corporately um the council will do sort of like the, the staff satisfaction the well-being type surveys uh, when people log on to clear review it might ask them you know how they're feeling and pulse checks um so that's that's not something we're specifically doing within our service because that's something that is dealt with corporately um and and that's that's in place um in relation to how staff are feeling do you get feedback from that? Yeah, so we get we get broad feedback. Yeah. From, from from the one that's done centrally. So you yeah, do so the one that's done centrally. How your staff are feeling yeah. about yeah. their service level. Yeah. And so we ask our staff. Noting as here, well. What we've got at the moment is seventy five percent of only seventy five percent of uh, of budget for staffing levels. You're down to seventy five percent. That's pretty low. Yes, yeah, it's, it's it's a complicated um, system in terms of how our service is funded, um, and the projection for a hundred percent is from April onwards. So it's just the way you know so, some of it is new grant funding that's come into the service, for instance, that we're recruiting to now. So would you say? I mean, would you say that your staffing levels have been, uh, let's say, for argument's sake, uh, since the beginning of November? Have your staffing levels been? On a, on, on a level that you would expect to have as staffing to do the job? I think, I think, under? yeah, I, th I think what, what happened particularly in um, September last year is in September there was quite a spike in demand. So even though we'd seen an increase in demand, there was quite a spike. Um, and the ban on evictions had ended in May. We then had the summer period. We then had the ending of furlough. So there were a lot of contributing factors that came in. So um, in terms of whilst we were then recruit, starting to recruit to some of the newer posts at the same time as having a spike, then yes, at that period, we're under-resourced. So, um, do we actually, thank you, well, thank you, Councillor Fur. I've just noticed it is 8 o'clock. Do you just, know the staff, oh. the, the, the staff turnover ratios? Sorry? Can I ask the final question I had, which was, do we actually know the staff turnover ratio in the department? Yeah, so we do we do get that information. We get that through um, through um, human resources. And is it? I don't, I don't have that now. Well, I mean, does, is it something that alarms you, or something that you don't worry about, or what? Um, I think it, if we do, I'll yeah. just let you answer that if you like. But I think if we have any further questions, if we can ask them to be emailed through, because um, I know that we did only have our guests until eight pm. Um, so. Yes, yeah, yeah. I mean, just very, very quickly. I mean, so, some yeah. of um, some staff that have left so over the last twelve months, it's not, it's not huge in terms of numbers, but have left in terms of career progression. 
Um, but I noticed also Lordez's got her hand up, so I yeah, think she might have wanted to say. respond to that as well. Yes, yes, I do. Um, and I, I just want to say that um, members have asked some really, really good questions in relation to quality of service. And I just wanted to add a little bit to that, that um, we all know that the homelessness is a very regulated process um, and it needs to stand scrutiny. And we have to carry out a lot of due diligence to ensure that we are progressing any application, homeless applications in in the, in line with the legislation and the council's policies, etc. So we have a number of systems um, that we actually monitor staff, how they perform, how they pick up, how they're performing, how they're responding, the check-ins, the performance management, the service is also regularly um, audited, where audit sometimes has pick up um, training and development and improvements of the service. The second point I just wanted to say, which is it, it kind of links to what Councillor Foote is asking in relation to uh, resources. Does the service have enough resources? As part of the constantly checking, is the service um, uh, performing? Is the Does the service has um, resources to deliver the service to the high standards? Um, so in that process that we often do, uh, we carry out service reviews and we make adjustments. In those adjustments, we take in consideration the resources that we need, depending on sometimes some very big initiatives that are happening. And I'll give you an example of the Afghan refugees. We decided towards the end of last year, the council committed that they wanted to deliver on that um, uh, uh, government um, initiative. So we put in more resources. That takes time to recruit and respond but we have resources to recruit. The council has delivered um, or is delivering on prioritizing care leavers. Many of you will know this. Uh, again, for that, we've again recruited and bring in resources. So it's a constant bringing in of it, the question about asking about, does the service need more people? Will it have, you know, there is limitations to many, how many people the service can have because the funding can only go so far, but um, it does have the resources. Um, to meet the needs, particularly for those that way we need to respond to the service. At the moment, we we are carrying out another um, uh, recruitment process, and Amanda is currently doing that, where we are appointing new staff to bring these people to respond to these initiatives that the council has decided to take on. So um, there will always be people come and go, so there will always be vacancies, but we will always be looking to make sure that the service is appropriately fully funded um, to meet the service um, that it needs. And if not, um, the, the service uh, is always making a case when we go to senior management, when we go to member, uh, lead member for housing, it's something that we are always making sure that we have the resources to, to, to deliver the service in the best way it can. So, um, and I think the last point I would say, I mean, homelessness is the, the volume, the demand. Yes, I can see the questions about the fatigue, the, the high volume of work that the services are doing. But the one thing I would say um, that there are, it's not all doom and gloom. Um, there are lots of lots of good news uh, stories that come out of the work that the services deliver and that staff deliver. And they feel quite passionate and very encouraged by delivering the good service. And the stories are hundreds and hundreds of them. And, and maybe that's what we probably don't do. We don't showcase all of the good news stories. But as a director, I do hold annual meetings with the staff. Senior management has an open door as well if they want to discuss things with me directly. Um, I can talk to staff. Peter Matthew, as you all know him, um, he has an open door policy as well for staff to approach him and, and talk to talk to them. So the staff do feel very comfortable that um, you know they can come and approach and talk to senior management, speak to Amanda, speak to the management team. So there is a, a support mechanism in there, and I think the important thing is it's also just to go back to to them and, and give them. Um, a thank you, appreciating what they do, because they are doing a very, very, very good piece of work. And the numbers show it. Um, and, the, you know, the numbers in relation to end of year, when I present them to them, they feel very encouraged by what they do. Um, and I'm happy to share with, with members if you want to see the end of year report that I did for them, which shows the numbers. Um, because homelessness is not just about the frontline people, it's about all of those people who are in that process on the different pinch points of that journey. I hope I've answered some of the points as well and supplemented some of the things that Amanda has said. 
No, that's really great. Thank you so much, Lourdes, for um, summing up. I wonder if I can be a bit cheeky. I did have one question. Yeah, if you do have to go, I will understand yeah, yeah, no, that as well. Um, it was just in terms of going, I was going back to our terms of reference, and part of that was understanding how empowered staff feel um, within their day-to-day -day roles. So I, don't, I feel like I'd just like a bit more information about how much flexibility staff do have, how kind of empower they do feel within their day-to-day -day roles um, and how that potentially could impact on um, their interaction with with uh, with service users. So is there anything that you're able to say on that, please? Can I just just say one thing? Amanda, you obviously you you is, is, you will probably want to add to this, but um, one of the things that we do want to do, and I, I constantly do it in the service, it's one of our values to feel empowered. And we want to live by the value for staff to own what they do, to take responsibility for what they do and be accountable for what they do. So within all of that, it's about empowering them to, to be confident about the jobs that they do. But Amanda, you, you can answer some, some of that more directly. Yeah, I, th I think because we're always um, striving for improvement as well, we want staff to be more empowered than they are. Um, so I, th I think what, what we've got is we've got staff that, um, when, when we bring staff into the service, as an example, is that it is about building blocks. We cover a really huge range. When people talk about housing and homelessness, um, mm -hmm. they think that sort of that's it and it's quite straightforward. It's not because we're dealing with all of the periphery issues that go around people's lives. You know, it's about the benefits, it's about the health, the mental health, the physical health so so I think so when staff come in we try to sort of give them some building blocks so they so they learn one aspect of the service and then they're, they're building on that to learn others so um and then basically when staff are then case working, they do have a degree of, you know, autonomy in terms of what they're doing. So they're covering things like a phone duty, you know, they're covering things like appointments, but they've got casework. They can they can manage and control their own time in terms of, you know, be, being sort of like empowered in how they how they manage their work and how they manage their workloads. Um, but it is also, you know, around how they, you know, in terms of empowering staff, it's a double-edged sword on that because we need our staff to empower our customers as well. So a lot of it is staff look at how can they actually get, get customers on the right journey so they're actually empowered to sort themselves out as well. Um, and it's interesting, you know, Lourdes mentions the values, you know, in terms of pass on the power, um, you know, we ask values-based questions at recruitment. So we're starting that relationship with staff and looking at the sort of the customer service um, as we actually recruit staff in so so generally um what we've identified and what we've identified through our sort of staff engagement in december is that that there is more that we can do there's always more that we can do and and what staff have recognized themselves is that there's more that they they want in terms of you know in terms of broadening their knowledge base so that then they're even more empowered to actually answer inquiries and things that things that come through so um yeah, so I think generally staff are. There were some quite high confidence levels in how staff responded to some of the more, you know, the more detailed questions. Um, but recognising that, you know, knowledge is power, we can always give, you know, more knowledge to staff. So great, thank you so much. Really appreciate you answering that for me and uh, for for us as a panel. Um, before I let you go, could I please ask for the presentation to be emailed over to Teresa? Um, that'd be great if we could get that. And yeah, just just to thank you again for your time this evening, um, for us answering all of our questions, um, you know, for um, giving us more information, um, and you know, get get um, with all this, we can it can it will help us uh, with our recommendations when we come to do that next time. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and you are free to leave if you um, would like, if you'd like to stay, that's up to, that's completely fine as well. So thank you so much for, for joining us um, today. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Chair. Have a good thank you. Bye, bye Thank you. Okay, so thank you everyone for your contributions. Um, for agenda item uh, four. Um, I think you will all agree that we had a really, really good discussion, um, lots of really good information for us to take forward. And um, when we start to come up with our recommendations and, you know, when we kind of like piecing it together as it were, um, and yeah, moving, um, moving forward with that.
Okay, so I will move on to agenda item five, um, and that is an update on the customer journey journey to housing in Hounslow survey that we um, decided to do as part of our engagement uh, last time. So just to remind you all, um, so last time we, as a panel, um, we decided to find out more information about the lived experience of those on the housing register. Um, we wanted to find out more about how changes to their housing, how, how changes to their status is communicated with them. Um, what what or any issues around waiting times um, and just and to get a better understanding of what the customer journey is like. Um, so we decided to do a survey uh, via citizen space. Um, so we do have an update from uh, Teresa. So I'd like to hand over to her to provide an update on the survey um, up to the, the up to this point. Okay, so thank you, Chair. Um, good night, everyone. Um, the preview of the survey was shared with everyone earlier today, and hopefully everyone would have seen it, but likely everyone may not have. Um, there has been a slight delay in launching the survey, as um, I explained in the email, but as you would know, our consultation and engagement team has spent some time um, on the survey, making sure the questions are structured um, to get the answers um, that we're really looking for for the deep dive, uh, making sure we are being as targeted as possible with our questions to ensure that those who um, would complete it would have had experience on the on the register or with the service overall. Um, you will see um, when you review the questions that the content itself remains pretty much the same and the focus is on understanding the lived experiences of those on the housing register or those who would have come into contact with the service. We are now looking to launch the survey on um, this Wednesday, and that will be just um, after midnight on the and the survey would close on the 22nd. So um, as I said in my email, um, any comments, if you can really share that with me by tomorrow noon, um, we are mindful that the survey will be running for just under three weeks. So hopefully we are hoping that it, this gives us enough time to get as much participation as possible um, from, from the public. Um, we are offering a price draw of two £20 vouchers for those who complete the survey. And we really encourage you to encourage um, others um, to share within your networks um, so that we have as much um, participation as possible. And we are also working with comms to promote the survey. So that really is the update for now. And I'll hand back to you, Chair. Thank you, Teresa. Um, I did have an opportunity to have a very quick look at it earlier. Um, I thought it was really well laid out. Um, the questions were very concise and I think they, they do capture what we were trying to um, get at with the survey. Um, so I don't know how many of you have had a chance to have a look at the survey yet, but I'm um, open to any any comments. And I understand like Teresa said, that we want to try to get it out to residents as soon as we can. Um, and hopefully if everyone is happy with it um, tonight, we can give that sign off. Um, but if there is any discussion or anyone that anyone wants to raise anything, um, please feel free to. Um, but yeah, so just mindful of the time. I think it would be good for us to try to get some sort of consensus today um, so that we can say, yep, we're happy for the, the survey to go live. Um, also, if anyone who hasn't had a chance to look at it yet, um, please feel free to do that now if that's something that you can, you would like to just, it's, like I said, very, very quick to get onto um, and have a look at um and yeah just to say if you're happy with us to continue with it as it is or if you have any comments um councillor bit if i can see that your hands up thank you yes um i emailed you but i got you out of office email so I realized too late that you wouldn't be able to see it i do have some comments and i don't know whether it's mm -hmm. best to raise them in this meeting or separately by email to teresa um as a broad brush, I think the overview needs to match the intro on the next section more closely, because I think some people might be put off by the intro who actually would fit in to answering it. I can explain that. I think it would like the opinions of a wide range of people seeking housing, but it's also people who've recently moved, not just seeking. Um, I have a couple of points on individual questions as well including if you're not 
on the housing register, but trying to get on it. That's one application, one point. Also, applying for housing or rehousing. I, I can give these in detail in an email if you like, because I'm just scanning the pages. In terms of the housing application was made for question two, I think it would be worth adding upsizing or downsizing, something that captures something else than single person's accommodation or family accommodation, because some of the more complex cases where a family wants to um, either stay together but isn't eligible for it under the rules or is trying to split for whatever reason, that's not covered. In terms of question three, I think the first question is actually two questions. The housing application process was easy to understand, is different from responsive to my situation. And I think some people might be torn about how to answer that and maybe opt for a one side rather than the other. I'm just trying to follow the questions um, okay. the survey as you're, as yeah. you're speaking, just to... Sure. Better understand what your points are. Um, Do you want me to go back or to? Yeah. Any any comments from you, Teresa, on on what we've kind of discussed so far, and in terms of like what how that would impact um, timelines? I think that that's the main one of the main. Oh. Sorry, I'm trying to get off mute. You oh, okay. <laughs> No, you've gone back on. Now you're on. Now you're fine. No more okay. clicking. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, if Councillor Bidoff can just put them in an email yeah. um, for me, and then I will reach out to customer engagement tomorrow and see okay. if we can just work them work them in. Okay. Or the edits in. Thanks. And then just to just to quickly go through other points on question five. That doesn't allow for people who need more frequent contact. So I think we need to say something, you know, if you're in a desperate situation, six months is awful, you're wanting to move tomorrow. So I think we have to allow for more frequent contact. Um, so for question five, are you saying, um, so one that's, I don't know, less than three think, months or some, yeah, so, other, some other sort of timeline? Time? I'm sorry, I should mean question six because question five oh, okay. was question six. when. And perhaps question five should be how long was the longest wait or something like that. Question six is where I think if you're in a fraught situation, um, you need to tick something other than six monthly. You might tick weekly, for example, in some situations or fortnightly, whereas we've only given them the narrow six, 12, 18 month or I know it says other, but it sort of implies longer than that rather than shorter than that. Um, and then on question eight, you might be in housing. So do you categorise yourself as on the waiting list? You're on the waiting list for a move, maybe, but you've actually got housing with the council you're wanting to change. So I think that needs to be accommodated. Um, and I think on question nine, we need a box underneath it for free flowing comments. But I can, I will put this into an email for Teresa. Thank you. Yeah, okay, thank you. Are there any other comments or feedback or mm. anything else anyone else on the panel would like to say? No, are we all happy with it otherwise then? Um, Councillor George? I'm sure if we, if there will be any, we will email you and Teresa and we'll keep in touch as we always do. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, Councillor Eason? Um, yeah, I'm just going through and send, I'll send you some pedantic um, uh, points um, shortly. So, yeah, but not for the meeting, but there's a couple of things I've spotted there. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so thank you. We'll, we'll take that on board. So if you 
whoever would like to email if you do email um and copy Teresa and I both into that email that'd be great um but yeah just be mindful of um we are hoping to get this survey out as soon as we can so hopefully um we're still able to do that um with, with the feedback as well um so yeah let's keep you updated um because so I think if we do go ahead tomorrow Wednesday we'll have just under three weeks um that the that the server will be out there in the public domain um for us to get feedback on um Councillor Foote I can see your hands up yeah your hands just a quick up. one I mean um I know that this came through at 12.45, 12.50 today. I mean, I, I've happened to be busy all afternoon, so this is the first opportunity I've had to read it, so I've literally skipped through it now. I can't say mm -hmm. I've absorbed it or, or are able to come back with any real uh, strong feelings on it, um, purely and simply because it just wasn't time. Um, can, can we just take that into consideration? I mean, it's, it, it's, if you send something out in the afternoon for an evening response to it, um you know many of us do yeah do um, yeah i, I don't I work think, you know i'm retired and, and yet i found i i've been tied up completely this afternoon up and right up mm -hmm. until uh, the meeting prior to this one that i was in so you know it's it, it's um it's something that we, we do need better information yeah, so, Chair, I can say that um, the, the flexibility remains and it's up to you, the panel, in terms of getting the, um, the the survey out. If we have edits to make and if people are not satisfied, I have to go back to the team and that will just mean there's just be a, a bit of a delay. So it could be that we don't go out on Wednesday, we go out on Thursday or we go out on Friday. But I do appreciate what you're saying about the turnaround. But it was sort of, we have shared, I think, um, the first first round of this before and there was some slight edits but not that many edits so this is sort of like the the, the a, a final round just for for sign off but if there are significant edits at this point then it will just have to be have to be delayed thank you Teresa. um yeah, well. yeah sorry was was just, did someone want to say something there I was just going to say a similar point to Richards in a way. The first time, I know we knew it was coming and the deadline was going to be short, but even so, I didn't have time to respond in the time that we'd said we should respond within. Yeah, like, no, completely understand and appreciate that. It is a very short turnover and unfortunately... It's just... No, I mean the previous stage, I mean, when, oh. so that's for the first lot, which is why I didn't respond to give any potential edits on that day. And I know we'd all collectively said let's do it as quickly as we can and preferably overnight or whatever. It was a very short deadline that we'd all agreed to. So I'm not apportioning mm. blame on anybody other than us um, collectively. I wasn't able to feedback then. And maybe I should have done it the next day or something like that. But I, you know, that was the deadline then. So I thought I would let it go. Yeah, no worries. Thank you. Thank that. Councillor Ethan, did you want to add anything? Uh, yeah, I was just going to say about... Um, what are we doing about um, publicising, distributing the survey? Um, uh, Chair, I think it might be you, it might be good if you were to send um, the survey to all councillors, drawing their attention to the work that we're doing, um, mm -hmm. and and asking them to cascade it to um, people that they know. Um, so uh, um, I don't know how you feel about doing that, just to. Um, um, make sure that all councillors get it and and that it's not as get it as a discreet email that they can then forward on not um a, a paragraph mm. 12 of the members matters on friday it can go in there as well but um uh, something a bit more a bit more visible because uh, this is important work we're doing and i think as chair you've uh, you've got every right to sort of um um, yeah, um push it yeah, no, thank you. I do really like that suggestion because we are trying to get and reach a, as wide an audience as possible. And if we can forward this quest, this survey on to um, our fellow councillors and get them to um, cascade it further, further that that'll be that'd be great. So yeah, really good suggestion. Thank you. Happy to do that. This was um, yeah, councillor, so I can see your hand is up, and I, I am just coming to you. So, yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah, I'm, I'm maybe I'm getting this wrong because I've, I've literally just flicked through it. So, you know, it's my first time of seeing it, but I got the impression that the survey is aimed at um, people on the waiting list. 
was it not? I mean, you know, surely they're the people we should be sending it to to find out their opinions of of how they feel about our, our service. My my understanding is that that's what we were going to do, but Richard's added a another dimension was that we could encourage our fellow councillors to do the same. Isn't that the point? No, I'm, 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 indeed, yeah. But I don't see, you know, what they my, send it to them. My, sorry, my point, sorry, my point was, was that um, our fellow councillors are doing casework with these people who are, um, who are using the service and that if they, um, that may be a, re a way of reaching um, people who are using the service. I don't know whether we we even have capacity to send the survey out to the people who are registered on the service because uh, they haven't necessarily uh, signed up to receive surveys, just um, service. So um, I think we did talk about some of this when we uh, did our workshop on the service, on the survey um, before Christmas. Or, or no, just after Christmas we did the uh, workshop. Yes. Yeah. I think that's when we discussed how we were going to um, share the survey once we had it to get as many responses as we could. Um, yeah. Okay, so are there any other point, further points on this on this point? No, so so like we've so like I said earlier, um, please do email through um, any points that you would like to um, to to both Teresa and myself. Um, but yeah, so I, the the aim is still to try to get this out as soon as we can, um, just so it is out there for as, as long as we as it can be. Okay, so um, if there isn't anything else, um, then. We're now on to any other business. Um, I don't have any, any other business. Um, so, oh, okay, Councillor Ethan. Um, yes, yeah, so, uh, just the email that we had from a resident, or I had from a resident this afternoon that I've shared. I've now managed to um, unpack what they are saying. And they're basically saying that um, Hounslow, along with half a dozen other local authorities, um, uh, did not submit um, quarterly data on homelessness into a, um, uh, um, a Ministry of Housing uh, um, yeah, uh, data set for July and September. Um, so, yeah, the question re the questions really are, um, are why didn't Hounslow do that? Um, how ma how many times previously has have we not done that? Um, and sort of why, yeah, um, what does this tell us about the way that we are um, uh, recording and managing data, uh, et cetera, in this area? Because uh, if you, yeah, it, it sets a few alarm bells. If we're, if we're not measuring, if we're not able to fulfill a, um, a statistical reporting um, yeah, um, court, for quarterly data, then, um, that, that's kind of worrying about the state of our systems in some way. So I'm wondering whether um, uh, Theresa is able to uh, to ask the relevant people and get the the explanation for that. As um, no, yeah. not not. Um, thank you, Councillor Eason. No, I have posed the question to our um, our data manager. To start with just so that he might he usually has some sort of like the, the, um, the insight that would be okay for us to take that as a question yeah so my sound i think is going a bit I'm yeah picture off Yeah, I think there was some sort of echo. Sorry, go ahead, Teresa. What were you saying? So I was saying that I have um, posed the question to our um, or, or the data manager. Um, now I think housing might have the the response as well. So definitely, I don't have a response for tonight to give you, but it's something I'll pursue and um, share an email with with the panel as to you know their reasons behind it. Yeah, no, that'd be great. Thank you for raising that. Um, 
and Thank we you. can get a response on that. Um, Councillor Eason, you're back again. Can you hear us? No, I think we've lost him. Um, Councillor Foote, did you have anything to add? Yeah, I, I would have thought the first question we would have asked is, um, this is true. Um, you know, Councillor Eason has seemed to have gone off on the basis that he's accepted everything that's been said uh, without actually checking as to, as to whether or not it's correct. So, Councillor Eason, oh, sorry. Councillor Foote, that's what I was saying. I would, I've spoken... I've sent an email out to our data manager because he usually have insights around, you know, what could really be happening in that situation. So when I get a response on that, then we could possibly, if it is the case, then we can also reach out to to housing who may have, you know, who will have further insight as well. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we just need a bit more clarification first and, and Teresa's going to find that out for us. Um, so um, thank you, Teresa. Um, right. So, oh, yeah. Sorry. Who's that? It's, uh, it's Richard. Um, yep, go ahead, please. Um, yeah, just in response, um, I clicked through the link and looked at the data um, and um, Hounslow, Brent um, and Sandwell and somewhere else were highlighted as no data for that quarter. So the report from the resident was um, uh, was was accurate, as I would expect it to be for that particular uh, resident. Um, yeah, so um, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. But um, so Teresa will write to um, will write and raise that for us as, um, and get a response back for the panel as well. So, um, right. So, Councillor Foot, your hand is still up. Did you want to add is anything sorry, else? Oh, okay. Not just legacy one. Okay. So I guess this brings us to the end of our meeting. Then, um, once again, I'd like to thank you all for your participation this evening. Um, and for the questions that you raise um, and look forward to any feedback that we that you would like to give on the survey um, and hope that we will be in a position to send that out to our residents as soon as possible. Um, but other than that, I'd just like to say um, the date of our next meeting. Does anyone know when that is? A little test for you all. 14th of March 2022. <laughs> Oh, top points for Councillor Foot there. Yes. So our next meeting is on the 14th of March 2022. I suspect that won't be an in-person one, but we'll, I will, um, I guess it's a bit of, um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it will be nice to see everyone um, in person as well, because it's, it's a different sort of meeting, isn't it, when you, when you have, when you're in a room and you know, the interaction is different as well. But thank you for your interaction today and for your participation. Um, yeah, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Take care. Goodbye, um, everyone.